We've seen structured proofs already. Um, now I want to go into a bit more depth and show us how to prove things, more sophisticated things, inductions in particular, and other stuff. So <clears throat> I think we've already seen, had at least a taster of the kind of things you can do and how you can nest scopes and that sort of thing. Um, and in fact, the basics of the ESAR language, so what it rests on, the foundations, I should say, are extremely simple. And I think it could be imported wholesale into something like Cock or Lean if they wanted to. And they would have to do a lot of work, particularly on the user interface side. So if, when you use Isabel J edit, that there's a huge amount of effort that went into allowing this interaction with a thing which instead of being command line oriented has got these things, you know, this language which is nested and so on right the way through. So it does require a sophisticated interface. But logically what's going on inside ESAR is extremely simple. Um, so for example, today when I talk about things like how to do inductions, this is extra stuff on top with the aim of making the language more practical to use. So even with this extra stuff I'll tell you about, there will be situations where structured proofs simply don't work. The issue here is that, and the whole point of structured proof is that we write uh, expressions <coughs> and assertions out explicitly. Um, that's fine in the examples I've seen where you've got a little formula and you say, assume this, then we have that, then we show that, we're done, we're happy. Um, but in all, not all, but certainly many real world problems, and especially things to do with system verification, your intermediate assertion is 100 lines, and there's no way you're going to retype that or even kind of generate the text somehow perfectly and paste it in here and there and there, because your proof is, of course, not going to be readable. Uh, in that case, you have to give up on the structured style. But kind of in between those extremes, we have things like induction, where as we see a little extra support in the language makes it more usable. OK. So here I'm going to talk about some of these extensions to the ESA language. Um, so one thing we'll see is some nice ways about talking about things that you have shown to exist. Again, none of this stuff is necessary. There are kind of, I have to say, in the case of this existential reasoning, doing without the kind of built-in facilities would require some rather hacky tricks that you probably wouldn't want to know about. Nevertheless, um, it could be done. I'll just do things a bit more not nicely with these uh, extensions to the ESAR language. Uh, in particular, when we do induction, the ability to do inductions without having to copy out the induction hypotheses and the conclusion is kind of going to be necessary. Um, similarly for case analysis. So I think I should give you some actual examples. So here are our binary trees all over again. Um, so any of those you who did foundations of computer science will probably recognize these binary trees. And the reflect function here, which we've seen before, and there is a proof that reflect of reflect of a tree gives you back the tree you started with. So all that is fine. Now here we're trying to do it as a structured ESAR proof. So we do our induction. Um, and now we have the two sub-goals. And they are the standard sub-goals you'd expect from induction. Now, if you remember from the previous lecture we had on this topic, I said, now to make a structured proof, you copy and paste those things and you have like show, the first one, blah, 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 prove it. Next, show the other one. And then to show, 
that thing, really what you would do is assume the induction hypothesis and then assume the other one and finally show the conclusion. So it's ridiculous. Um, so you don't have to actually copy it all out because they are predefined for you. Now at a low level, the way you can see what's available for you is by typing this weird thing called print cases. And by the way, you don't have to do this anymore, so if you think this is really stupid, um, let me go ahead a bit and say, now this is an old slide, but if you did this like yesterday, and you put proof induction T, you would see a little blue dot next to the word proof. Now, as you know, a blue dot means you should probably take a look. So if you clicked on that blue dot, it would actually paste in for you a complete skeleton of your induction proof so that you would have your base case and your inductive step already generated for you right there in the file. Not with the proof, so they would have sorries, you know, it, it's not going to do anything difficult for you, but it would automatically generate all the cases for you. And of course, that's nice. But um, you still, I think, should know about print cases because it gives you a way of seeing what's inside here. So when you type proof induction T, the induction proof method sets up certain things for you, and they're kind of cool. So it, there is a data structure inside Isabel, or inside Isabel Hall, the higher order logic version we're using, which knows about induction and cases and says there, I know about two cases. One is called LF. In the case LF, there is a variable called question mark case. Now, this is a slightly unfortunate thing. So I've told you that question mark variables represent unknown quantities in goals. Now, somehow, uh, and I can't say I approve, but Macarius, who invented all this stuff, decided that the question mark variables could also be used for kind of, shall we say, temporary bindings. So he is allowing here the thing called question mark case to abbreviate the base case of the induction, that is the statement of the base case of the induction. In the second one, that is BR, you can see there, oh, let, me, let me use my builds, so you have to actually type that into your window. You get your two cases, um, and in the in the case BR, so which is your inductive step, it is a snippet of proof, basically, in which there are three variables. Sorry, that is a conclusion. But there, there are three variables, the A, the T1, and the T2. The variable thing called case now has the statement of the uh, inductive step. And it also has, where it says br.ih, it has the statements of the two induction hypotheses. Um, OK, and now for a very cryptic thing you need to know about. A variable name ending with an underscore, like you see there, is not a real variable name. So you are not actually allowed to have a bound variable name with an underscore in it. So what that's telling you is it is kind of like a template. You can put in any variable names you like. Uh, so you can choose whatever you want. And that is showing you the template of how the names that you choose will be substituted into those things. Um, now here is a proof skeleton that has been filled in using SIMP. As I mentioned before, if you simply type proof induction T there and nothing else, you get your blue dot next to the word proof. And if you clicked on it, it would give you a skeleton almost identical to this, except it would have sorry in case of by SIMP, because that induction thing that gives you a skeleton doesn't try to prove anything. It is just trying to set you up to prove it yourself. Of course, this was a very, very simple thing to prove. But I guess what the point you should see now is this is an ESR structured proof, and yet 
nothing has been copied out here. In other words, I have not had to restate the base case and the inductive step. You might say this violates the whole idea of a Ezar structured proof that we're meant to copy things out and be explicit. But I guess the point is here, it's kind of dumb, especially when you've stated your induction formula right above that you should be copying out instances of it over and over again. So there we have our two cases. Um, and now the word question mark case, so I showed you on the previous slide, it gets bound to different formulas for each of the two cases. And each time they are the correct case, so the first one is going to be the base case, the second one is going to be the inductive step. Um, now those bound variable names, of course, do not have underscores after them. Uh, we could have chosen anything we wanted. In fact, as there are no explicit, oh dear. No, I do not know. So here's a thing you could play with if you want. If you simply typed case BR without any variable names, will it let you? I'm actually not sure. You shouldn't do that, though. It looks a bit ugly. Um, what I'm showing you there, if you see the cursor, is between the then and the show. And the point is that when you type case of something, um, the induction hypotheses are chosen, and that means that if you then do then, they will be piped in to the next thing you try to prove. So when you say case blah then, your induction hypotheses are given to the next proof step. So here, the induction hypotheses are made available to the word simp there, to the proof method simp, which will then prove the case for you. Um, now, you might ask, why bother? How long is that proof? So that's a seven line proof when you could do it in one line if you just said, by induction T comma alter when you strung them together and fit them on a single line. You could do that, and that's totally fine, actually. Um, I actually think it's kind of dumb to write out the full thing with all the cases when they're all proved by simp. But of course, I just want to show you what it looks like. OK, now here is something a little more complicated. Um, we saw FinSet in the previous lecture, so the definition of a finiteness predicate for sets. So we made all those definitions before, and indeed I think we did this exact example before as well. That is to say, a subset of a finite set is also finite. What I want to show you now is what happens when there is a context when you do induction in the first place. So you see how I've written the, the, the lemma statement. I have fin set and B subset A implies fin set B. So there are assumptions explicitly in there. And then I say do an induction. Um, I'm sorry, yeah, this is kind of murky stuff. But those assumptions will be seen by the, induct the induction proof method. And now, when you do your print cases there, you will be able to see what it does with the stuff it's been given. Um, oh, yeah, there's the induction rule. Um, so first of all, the empty case, the base case. It's got a fix. Why is it fixing something? It's fixing B because we had arbitrary B in the call to the induction method. Um, the base case is the thing we're trying to prove, which is fin set of B. And this is kind of weird, actually. You might have assumed from the previous example that the base case would be inserting the empty set into the case. But in fact, the thing we're trying to show here, namely fin set of B, 
doesn't mention the induction variable at all. So the case, in fact, you see this variable question mark case is identical in the two cases. Um, and what's weird is this thing called prems. So this is the stuff that has been fed into it from the previous well, in general, in the previous step, and here fed into it because the statement of the lemma had assumptions in it. So because we had fin set of A and B subset A available to us, uh, now the induction will have grabbed the fin set of A and used it for itself. So that is taken away. But the other thing, B subset A, is still around. And now what happened? You see now in the first case there, it has turned into B subset, empty set. So we did induction on A. In the base case, A becomes the empty set. And therefore, the thing that was originally fed into the induction is transformed into B subset, empty set. In the other case, um, you can see now for the premise variable there at the very bottom of the slide, B subset of inserting a little a into big A. So again, we have replaced the original variable A that was in the theorem statement um, by something for the particular part of the induction we're going to do. So this is showing you, even before you start, what, it, what Isabel thought of the induction you set up. OK, now here is just the base case. So here we are trying to do our proof. The first case is called empty I. Ah, you know why it's called empty I. It's because I used empty I in the inductive definition at the top of the slide. Question? Yeah, sorry, can we go to Do you want to see the previous slide? Yes. Sorry, now what did you say? Um, so in the, at the bottom, there's assume insert I. At the bottom of the slide, what? Yes, assume insert I dot. Okay, yeah, yeah this is kind of ugly. So you have like three different subvariables. One is called hypes, one is called IH, and the other is called prems. And I honestly can never remember which is which. Well, IH is for induction hypothesis, so that's pretty straightforward. Prem seems to be the side formula that was fed in from the top. And fin set of A is, I guess, also connected with the induction. That is, because you're doing induction on a finite set A in the inductive step, we can assume that we have, because now A is a local variable there, uh, local to that case, and we can assume that is a finite set as well. So hypes is, in my mind, it is closely connected with the induction hypothesis, even though I think this particular proof method keeps them separate. I, if you look at other inductive proofs, you'll see that they use the induct proof method instead of the induction proof method. And this is a kind of teeny tiny difference between them. I think they set up these variables in a different way. So I think there is no hypes in the induct proof method, something like that. Okay, shall I continue? Okay. Um, so to show the base case, what I want to show you there, again, you see the cursor, the uh, red dot is after then. So now, although it is a base case, something is being fed into the proof because we had those premises in the cases where we saw on the previous slide. And the premise that we've got is B subset, empty set, uh, which will make this theorem trivial, because of course B equals the empty set. Um, also, because B is listed there as arbitrary, it becomes a bound variable name in each of the cases. And now, seriously, guys, if you call it anything other than B, you're just being um, 
shall we say, perverse. So don't do that. I think you could leave it off there and it would just be called B. Um, okay, now let's look at the other part of the proof. Here, so we're going to look at the insert part. And I guess last time we did it by sledgehammer. Now this time we're going to try and be a little more explicit. So you see, first of all, the case, the inductive step case, we have insert I, we have the big set A, the little set, little A, which is the thing that we're assuming is being inserted into this set to make a bigger finite set. We have B, which is the arbitrary other set, and which I think you could leave off. And we're trying to show that B is finite. And instead of just giving the whole job to Sledgehammer like we did last time, we're going to try and prove it ourselves. So we do a case analysis by saying, well, either B is a subset of A or it's not. Uh, here we go. Um, now again, so I think what I did here, because I did this slide a long time ago, in fact, it's so old, you see if it says find rather than query at the bottom, then it's an older slide, sorry about that. So if you did this today, when you said proof cases, exactly like proof in duct, you would get a blue dot. And if you clicked on the blue dot there, it would give you case true, sorry, next, case false, sorry, next. And that way, it, you would again have the skeleton of the proof given to you. Anyway, so in this case, we are, we are considering the two parts the, the two possibilities explicitly ourself. I just want to show you there what it looks like. Um, so that is the whole proof. I can see I still use Sledgehammer at the very bottom, but there you see that there are two cases, B subset A, which I think is immediate by the induction hypothesis, and then if B is not a subset of A, uh, there is something else happening. And what am I showing you here? Well, there are the true and false cases separated out with the word next in between them. To, to, uh, next will end the context and open a new one. Um, ah. So when you're in, in this case, case insert I, so that is the name of the case, and that identifier also refers to all the assumptions connected with that case. So the induction hypothesis, the thing called prems, the thing called hype, all of them together are bundled in as that thing called insert I, that is the name of the, the current case you're in. And so they are all being made available to show the conclusion there, which is by auto, because this is the easier case. Um, now here we have nested cases, or, or rather a nested proof, where okay, you have an induction on the outside, you have case analysis on the inside, and there can you see uh, in the case false, so B not a subset of A, so false refers to precisely that. False refers to B not subset A. Now when I re refer to false there, so it says with false, false is an actual reference to that claim of the false case. So there the word false means B not subset A. Ah, now another quite useful thing. Um, it's kind of ugly to give all of your formulas uh, arbitrary names, especially names like A, B, C, or even worse, numbers. So a thing that we can do, I don't know if you can see very clearly, you see that last build with the arrow pointing at that thing, and those funny little things which are like continental quotation marks, uh, which are called cartouches, that enclose the formula B subset insert little a, a. So that is actually a, a 
an assumption we have available at the moment. I think it is the prems variable, something like that. But instead of referring it to the identifier, I guess it would be insert i dot prems, which is pretty cryptic, you've got to admit. Instead, we write out the property that we want, and we put it there in those cartouches, in those funny quotes. Isabel then checks that it is aware of a fact of that sort, um, and if so, then it gives you that fact. And that is, as long as the facts you're referring to are relatively compact like that one, that's probably the clearest way to write a proof. So nobody has to ask, you know, what the hell does that mean? Whereas, you know, I had to talk for five minutes to tell you what false meant. Whereas I could have quoted that as well, and then you would have seen I'm using not B subset A, because I would have written it out literally. All right, it's time for this. Well, anyway, I hope that's logical. Um, arguably, the ESAR language is richer than it ought to be. Um, but I guess it's attempts to try and streamline the things that we're allowed to write. So if you look at the left side and the right side, there are equivalent ways of writing things. So, for example, on the left, when I say show using, um, using refers to previous theorems and will make them available to the next thing you do. Um, what you can do instead, so if you look at the arrow on the other side there, what does this do? Oh, sorry, let me ignore that. If you look at the arrow there, it says you can also have with. Now, what do we mean by with? Well, the point is that true. You see, on, on the left here, we had using insert i and true. But true is the thing just above. So with says, take the thing that we just had from above and then add other stuff to it. So it's just slightly streamlined. Um, So what is the next pink arrow there? So I had something using. Now, as an alternative to using written, as you see, after the word have, you can write from, and then exactly the same thing, but with from, before the word have. I think there may be a tiny difference between how the theorems are used in the two cases, but I, I, am, I can never remember if there is a difference or how significant it is. So it's kind of your choice as to whether to say have something using blah or from blah have something. And then further down you can see a, another case where I turned then have using into with. Now you don't need to do any of these things but as I said, if you want your proofs to look good, if you have relatively few labels and try and use these things in an idiomatic way, just so that you can, um, it is just slightly shorter. So the right-hand side version, I would say, is a little better than the left-hand side. You see, the nice thing about with is that you know that your knowledge is flowing down from above. So with means I'm using the previous result. Whereas when you say using, and then you have a label that just happens to the previous result, that's a bit clunkier. But honestly, this is all kind of very, very minor refinements of, of your proofs. So there I have, you know, from is more or less the same as using. With is exactly the same as then from. I think in this case, it is a, literally a macro expansion from with to then from. Okay. 
I told you about the cartoon. Oh, is that a question? Yeah, so a few lectures ago we talked about these abbreviation hands, and I think then you told us that they are not as beautiful or you wouldn't use them. I believe this was about hence and thus. Yeah, no, uh, exactly. Yeah. Well, I don't mind. You can use them if you want. Um, the funny thing is that Macarius, who invented most of this language, but he's very, a very strong-willed person, and at some point I think he decided he didn't like his own creation there. So he doesn't like them anymore. But, you know, it's up to you. Um, it is a problem, perhaps, you know, arguably, if you want to talk about language design, that maybe one shouldn't have too many alternative forms. But I'm just showing you the language as it is. I was just wondering if the same applies to uh, width, then, because it's uh, also then... Uh, it may be one of the arguments against something like thus is that um, because width kind of implies then, um, I don't think you can have with thus. Maybe you can. I, it might work. I don't know. But it would be redundant because then you'd be including the previous thing twice. Once because of thus and once because of with. But the width is the same as stem from, right? Yeah. So width is then also basically an abbreviation of stem from. And the same applies uh, to that that we probably should use. Uh, I think you're accusing Macarius of being a bit illogical here, which you may be right, but okay. what can we do? Um, now, I mentioned a moment ago that you can put any known facts in these cartouches, in these weird quotation marks, in order to refer to them. Um, you can only do this if it is a fact, and one way of finding out what the facts are is by typing print facts into your file. I think also using the query panel, which we don't have here because it says fine, but if this were more up to date, I think if you click on query, one of the sub panels there allows you to look at the available facts. But you can see here, um, there's a whole bunch of things. So there we are in our proof. We've just proved a thing we call BA, and so BA is available there as a fact. Uh, we can also see false because we're in the false case. So the identifier false is available to us as a fact. Uh, what else have we got? There are some standard things. So the thing called ASSMS, which refers to any explicit assumptions of your theorem, is blank here, and I suspect it's probably actually undefined, and you'll get an error if you refer to it. Uh, there you have the inductive, the insert I case, and then you also see the three separate kind of sub-identifiers, that is IH, heights, and prems, all shown separately. And you even have this. Oh, I'm not sure I've mentioned this before. So the previous thing you proved is always bound to, is, is always referred to as this. So Whenever you write this, it always refers to the last thing that you proved uh, in your current proof. So in this case, this is, this is the same as BA because BA is the, the last thing you proved at that moment. Um, things get a little tricky if you have nested induction. So what if I got two trees? let's say with the binary tree example. I do an induction on a tree, and then in the inductive step case, I have another tree, and I do an induction on that as well. And then you might have two inductive steps, and then you say, how can I refer to the outer um, inductive step because the identifier has now been taken over by the inner one? Um, and that, I'm afraid, will require a little trickery, which um, I haven't shown you yet, but if you ever find yourself in that position, you should email me. Uh, there are other ways of creating synonyms. Uh, there's a thing called note, which allows you to um, uh, make abbreviations for other lists of theorems, and you could do that in order to refer to, to make an alternative name for an inductive 
identifier if you're doing nested inductions. <coughs> uh, what are we talking about here? Ah, this is just a reminder of how JEdit works. So when you type print facts, and you can barely see it there, if it's just above that big black rectangle there, just above is the word print facts, which I seem to have typed. Uh, it is then underlined, and the underlining is a hint to you that there is something there which you, either you can hover over it, as I've done to get a pop-up window, or you can just click on the output panel and see it that way. So this is the same information as in the previous example. It's a very sad situation. Okay, now here's the thing. I guess we saw a very similar example before. In case you're wondering what the blue dot there means, I always am very excited when I see a blue dot because either the thing is already known to be true or it can be seen to be false. Well, in this case, that exact theorem is already in the system, so it knows it, so I know this already. Um, but anyway, here I'm going through a bit of a proof for you. And there you see a new word, namely obtain. So the point here, I've got the assumption that A divides B. And that, you see at the very bottom of the slide there, it shows you the definition of that thing. So I'm sorry, I see it has the arguments reversed. I had never noticed that until now. So apologies. but. A divides B means that B is equal to A times something, uh, which you see in that uh, obtain line, we say, let's call that something V. So we obtain a V such that B equals A times V. And that is, I, I see I use sledgehammer to prove that, but it's kind of obvious. It's just by the definition of divides and the assumption that referred to it. Then I do it again. So you see the line below that, I obtain a W, and that is for the second divide relation because B divides C. We're trying to show the transitivity of the divides relation, and of course we have this B and this so we have this V and this W, and that will give us something, oh, sorry. That will give us something to, to prove the result. Um, what am I showing you here? You see where the cursor is, so where the, the red cursor is right after the word obtain, or rather after the obtain V. Now, if you look at the output at that moment, you're going to see something that looks a bit scary. So that is indeed the exact form of the thing being proved. Uh, I know that looks weird and ugly. Um, 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 um. Well, this is just the form of an elimination rule. And the point of that is that if one has this rule and then uses it in a kind of backwards chaining form, it will take whatever you are trying to show, that is thesis, and give it a new thing, which is the, um, a new bound variable, namely v, with the assumption that b equals a times v. Uh, and I guess one way you could get rid of obtain is by writing things of that sort, of that form, yourself, and proving them. But that would be very, really ugly. So instead of, looking at, instead of doing that explicitly, you just use obtain. And you normally, I would say 99% of the time, will never need to look at that. But I'm just showing it to you in case you see it and freak out or something. OK. What is this moreover? Um, it's related to the equational reasoning thing we've seen already. So we have, with then, the ability to take one previous fact and give it to the next step. 
but sometimes it's useful to accumulate a whole bunch of facts one after another and then give them to a next, uh, uh, some following step. So for that we have moreover, and you can iterate moreover any number of times to accumulate as many results as you want. So in this case we obtained V, but we weren't finished, we needed more, so we said moreover. That puts the previous result aside on a kind of stack, and then we do some other thing. So that property is being remembered. Um, and now you obtain the next one, that is W. And when you're finished with your moreovers, as I said, you could have any number. Here we only have one, but you could have any number. Finally, when you're, sorry, ultimately, when you're finished, you put in the word ultimately, and then it gives you all the stuff you just proved. Now this, again, of course, you don't need to do this. You could just call them one, two, three, four, five, and then you find at the end, say, from one, two, three, four, five. But of course, the structure here is much clearer. And in particular, it's clear that you're not, you're probably not using these in any other way. So there, the, when you type ultimately, you're able to see exactly what it thinks you wanted to have available. So it's quite easy to put the word moreover in the wrong place if you don't know what you're doing. But then you would see when you, when you looked at your uh, calculation there, uh, you would see that you had the wrong facts available. So ultimately, it's going to give them to the next step and then you're going to be able to prove what you want. And there we are. So you see, it's a nice proof. We obtain V, we obtain W. The desired factor is V times W, and then the result follows. So that's a nice, clear, structured proof. We can do better. Um, so in particular, you can obtain multiple things at once. And what it shows you in the ah, and there's a from. So the, I, as I mentioned, ASSMS or assumptions refers to the things in your assumes line. So now both of the divides assumptions are being made available here. Uh, then we do our obtain, we obtain two things at the same time and you look incidentally at the form of the elimination rule there for this obtain uh, that it actually is a single rule so it's not nested rules but a single rule that has V and W mentioned. Oh dear the dreaded double dot. Um, I don't mind if you never use double dot. I can never remember. So I believe I said that if you type proof followed by nothing, it will use a certain default rule. Now I am pretty sure that proof followed by nothing is the same as proof followed by double dot, though nobody ever does it. Maybe I should try it while you're doing your lab. Um, if you do this sort of thing, that is you put double dot there, so that means that you presumably know, or at least decided to give it a try, that the default rule for the particular primitive is exactly the one you need to prove the goal here. Uh, if you do that, you're showing off. Maybe showing off is the right thing to do to get the most marks, but just to be honest with you, I never do that, right? I mean, this is, this is basically being a prat. Okay, a few more um, little remarks. Oh, by the way, notepad is a kind of useful thing. So if you want to fool around with stuff that is not a real proof, you can type notepad and then begin and maybe end and then you just can write in stuff like that and it, it can be helpful. So there we have on the left, a bunch of facts with labels and from those labels and there you have on the right the corresponding version 
with moreovers. And you can see at the bottom of the slides where on the left side you are simply picking the three theorems because I used from. On the right side they are being given to you because you used ultimately. Okay, and now here's another weird and wonderful Ezar thing. Um, this is consider. So you see there's the word consider, and there's a vertical bar in between, and there are two formulas, and the labels even and odd, they're optional, so you don't have to give your cases labels. Uh, if you don't, they will be one, two, three, and so on. They'll be labeled by uh, digits. So what this is claiming is I mod 2 is either equal to 0 or it is equal to 1. So you are making this claim, and of course you've got to prove it. So it's a little bit like obtain. In fact, it's a generalization of obtain, although in this case we don't have any bound variables. So I is already defined up above. And we're saying either I mod 2 is 0 or I mod 2 is 1. In the line below that, we prove it using a fact to that effect. And now the reason we might do this is because of the way you, you see how we now have then have something or other. Um, and then you have proof by cases. And the cases will be the things that you just find right above. There are two cases, namely I is even or I is odd. Because um, you see, I mean you could have proved this a different way. So if you didn't know about consider, you could for example prove a thing by cases on whether I mod 2 equals 0. In that case the, the false would be I mod 2 not equal to 0, and from that you would prove I mod 2 equals 1. And then it would be the same as before. So in this particular case, it's not that necessary. There are situations, though, where it's nice to, re to separate the, ana the analysis of the separate cases. So these, these, let's say, three or four cases are non-trivially different and exhaustive. And then you use that fact to prove something else by the case analysis that you just set up. So it's another way of showing off how clever you are, basically. Here is something a lot simpler, if and for. So we've already got fixes and assumes. If and for are exactly the same, except you write them afterwards. Again, you could argue that Macarius has given us too much syntax, but it's sometimes convenient. So I generally, I use if and for in, together with have. I don't like using it with lemma, although you're allowed. What it allows you to do, I mean, I hope it's obvious. So have, in this case, x, x less than r, if means they are the assumptions, and for means they are the local variables. So this is exactly the same as in writing it all in reverse order. Fixes xr, assumes x less than something, 0 less than r, and finally shows um, the x x less than r. Uh, anyway, that particular form with fixes and assumes isn't allowed with have. So for have, you actually need these. This is, yeah, without them, you'd have to do some quite ugly things. So it's very useful that you're able to introduce these local variables and assumptions in a have. The word that, in this case, is going to refer to the assumptions that is x less than l and r and zero less than r. And you see the result, once you've proved 
this thing, which has its if and its for. Now, if you look at the, the bottom panel there, the automatically generated result is, it's got these two assumptions and it's got those two free variables, x and r. So that is what it's going to give you in the end. A very last and highly obscure thing is a local proof block. We don't actually need to do this. Funnily enough, this is an earlier version of consider. So before we had consider, you could do this. So you see the top line there, P or Q or R. We have a case analysis and we're going to prove it just using have. Um, now, the things in the braces are local proof scopes. We're here. For example, the first one is assuming some formula P, using that to prove a formula S. Note that it's have because we have no goal here. Um, and so we, what we're doing with those various moreovers is we are combining the case analysis of P, Q, R, and then three claims that P implies S, Q implies S, R implies S. Um, and finally, we're using that to show S. So this is a kind of case analysis. And um, as I said, we have a much cleaner way of doing this now using consider. But the reason I'm still showing it you anyway is there will be other situations where occasionally it's useful to type a left curly bracket and maybe do a fix and maybe do an assume and do some proofs, end up with a have. And what you'll have then done is have a kind of disembodied proof of a thing that you might be able to use for something else. And there we are.